I want to invite you into a conversation on the relationship between homosexuality and Christian faith. Hi, I'm Mark Mellinger from the Gospel Coalition, and joining me to walk us through this is Rosaria Butterfield, author of Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Hey, it's really good to have you here. Thank you for setting aside the time. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, a lot that we can get to in this interview, and, and let's start here. In your previous life as a lesbian, you said that you largely experienced born-again Christians as ungracious people, almost fanatical in temperament. Largely, I didn't say entirely, right. but, but that was largely your experience. Let me ask, that was quite a while ago, more than 15 years ago, do you think that's changing now? Well, that's a hard question because it says a lot about point of view, but I was a professor at the time and my experience with Christians was that for the most part they were fearful people. Uh, they use the Bible as a punctuation mark to end a conversation rather than deepen it. And if I had any questions, uh, thus saith the Lord ended the question. And so I, I'm not, I, I didn't understand if they uh, obeyed such a holy and great God, why they were motivated so, by so much fear. So, you know, that context, you know, it was that sort of snippet. The other context that I really interfaced with Christians with were gay pride marches. And <laughs> let, let's face it, uh, the raising of political placards is not all always the friendliest <laughs> no. of exchanges so you know I would but, see the placard with the I'm going to hell and then a friend of mine put together a placard that said you know if if AIDS is God's curse on homosexuals then lesbians must be God's chosen people and you know so so let's just face it that it's just that is probably not the best opportunity for dialogue so it truly wasn't until I met Ken Smith as a friend and as a neighbor pastor of the RP church in Syracuse pastor, where you were pastor. a professor that's right. That uh, that uh, some of those um, some of the external difficulties that <laughs> I think are always there in interfacing with people who just simply think differently than we do. Those were put aside. Okay. So, so you're saying that's always going to be there. There's always probably going to be a segment about evangelicalism that's like that. You may not have been getting the whole picture. Absolutely. And I think the, the other challenge is, and, and right now we are we can really feel the pressure because. We are in a crisis, we're in a moral crisis, we're in a civil crisis, and Christians are losing. I, I mean, that's let's just how it is. It. That's oh, that's just how it is. And, and one of the things we can do is acknowledge the fact that when Christians are losing socially and politically, we actually do better. We do better. We, in what sense? Uh, we pray more and we're humble. Mm. And we do not make moral proclamations in place of gospel invitations. Now, one of the big challenges that we will always have is, and it's just a simple rule, and in fact, I'm sure you, you have noticed this, that this Lord's Day when you go to church, if you said everything that was on your heart about everyone in the church, how would that go for you? It wouldn't go over it so go well. Very well. I'm a pastor's uh, wife. I, I, it really wouldn't go I'd over I'd probably get kicked me. out of the church. Right, 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 right. Maybe out of the state. Right, exactly, because <laughs> you know and I know that the strength of your words needs to match the strength and the integrity of your relationship. Mm. Well, that's true for unbelievers, too. Don't presume that your uh, gay and lesbian neighbors, that the worst sin in their life is sexuality. Maybe the worst sin is unbelief. In fact, it is. unbelief actually we know it is, is a higher sin. So try to, how can you possibly have strong words without strong relationships? Mm. And how can you possibly have strong relationships without taking the risk of being rejected? Mm. See, there's a personal risk. If you want to put the hand of the loss into the hand of the Savior, you actually have to get close enough to get hurt. And that's going that's a new idea for many Christians, but it's the it's it's the ground rules of the new game. Well and, and I think that the reason for a lot of Christians that that is a difficult thing to think about is because you know if it is a gay and lesbian coworker or neighbor, there's probably going to come a point in that relationship where even if it starts out friendly and, and totally on good terms, there's going to come a point where they're going to know how you feel about their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. how do you suggest Christians navigate that mm -hmm. moment, that part right. of a relationship? Well, that part of the relationship is true for any unbelieving neighbor. 
Yes, yes, you're right. So first of all, I don't, it, that doesn't really register on the Richter scale for me. So that's part, that is the, but the other real issue is. It is a deeply held identity though, it is, right? It's a, and, and it has a political lobbying block, which makes it even harder. Yes. So the one thing though that you want to do always with your unbelieving neighbors is to try to figure out what the gospel bridge is. You know, it, it might not be through the rebuking of sexual sin. Uh, you know, I, I don't. Yeah, yeah, you don't need to go there. I, well, you might need to go there. But, but not necessarily. But what if you are neighbors to, you know, what if you're a lesbian neighbors who have been in a committed, you know, marriage for 50 years, have separate bedrooms, and haven't had sex in 20 yeah. years? And you <laughs> will look like an idiot yeah. when you rebuke them for their sexuality. And they will be the first to tell you that, you know, menopause is come and gone, man. And it's, you it's are done. poopy. Yeah. Right. So, so let's be clear on what the sin is. You know, the Lord is very specific. When when the Lord convicts us of sin, it's not on the surface. No. And you know, God forbid if when we repent of this of sin, all we do is deal with the surface. So why don't you find out what's going on? And find out what the some of the real deep issues because you know homosexuality is a root of something else. Yeah, it, I remember you said that in yeah. your book. You said homosexuality it, is is symptomatic. It, it is, is not symptomatic. Causal. Okay, so now, now explain what causal. you mean and, and why that is so important to understand. Well, because if all you do is repent of a sin at its surface, it would be like you and I going out in the garden and we see all of these dandelions and we're going to solve the problem by snipping the tops off. Okay? You know that doesn't it, work. They'll well, come it, back. in fact, it makes it worse. Yeah, that's and what right. it does is it, it makes it worse. And I think so often we are asking people to repent of a, of a fruit sin and not going to its root. And Romans 1 tells us what the root of homosexuality is. And, and, and I, I, you know, I felt like my experience, uh, I, re I really resonated with Romans 1. The fruit of homosexuality is the ethical outworking of a heart and a mind and an identity that rejects the idea that God is author and that the implication of that, that the Bible has the right to interrogate my life, not the other way around. So really what homosexuality is, is it's an ethical outworking of original sin. And you know what that means? We're born that way. We're all born that way. It's common and, to everybody. And any have, sexual sin is really a manifestation sin, of that, right? It, absolutely. And so I don't think of we should not think about our gay and lesbian neighbors as some as some, some as a struggling with something that is different. Absolutely. It is not different. It's and part it, of the human condition. It is part of the human condition. We all reject God and want to be in control of our own lives. You're saying that's what's really going that's on what's, here. That's what's really going on. Now it gets <coughs> complex in this new world of revisionist theology, um, the, the six scripture passages that condemn homosexuality aren't really true, God didn't mean that. We, we, we are, the challenge is we are dealing with a weak gospel presentation over the course of decades combined with a silly sinner's prayer that have falsely allowed people to think that they are Christians because there's a video of them singing, you know, this little light of mine, right. uh, you know, in their church choir. And really, the the need to share the real gospel is um, it's urgent, both within and without the church. So when someone says to me, I'm a Christian and I'm gay, I often, I don't have to ask you why you think you're gay because, you know, I get it, <laughs> but I do have to ask you why you think you're a Christian. What, th th that's I mean, I, I, and, yeah. and hopefully yeah. we are friends enough that I can slowly, you know, that you and I can get there because friends want to know those things. Can, can someone self-identify as gay and be a Christian? Someone can identify as someone who is struggling with same-sex attraction. Uh-huh. You, you will struggle. And some people will call those will identify that as gay Christians. That's what yes. they will call themselves. You yes. don't have a problem with that. I have a big problem with that. You do have a big I, problem I, with that. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Well, I'm an English professor, of course. <laughs> we can, I guess we can't, we can't diagram a sentence back here. But, <laughs> but um, uh, gay is an, ad, it, it's an adjective. Christian is a noun. And the, the job of an adjectival modifier is actually to change the noun it modifies. So you say you're a gay Christian, you know what you're doing? You're putting on the wrong team jersey. It's a paradox. It and can't you're work. going out on the field 
and you're playing and you're confusing everybody. You may be a Christian who struggles with same-sex attraction. You may be a Christian who struggles with any manner of sin. But as soon as you embrace an adjectival modifier and claim that as your identity, you are not identifying fully with Christ. And here is what you are saying. You say you're a gay Christian. You are saying, Holy Spirit, don't touch me there. That's off limits. That's my identity. So no, I'm. I, I, I do you think I have strong opinions. Mark? I do. I don't know. <laughs> and, that, and, and and that's fine. That's, that's why it's one reason you're you're an interesting but interview and making an impact. I talk about that in, in uh, my my workshop. This, yes, this it, here at the Gospel Coalition's yes. Women's Conference, where we're doing this interview. A few more things that I want to sure. that I want to get to, uh, and I'm going a little longer with you than I am on many of the other interviews because people really want to hear oh, from you. I'm so sorry. Uh, you you do believe sexual orientation can change. This has been sort of a politically uh, controversial issue. You, you honestly believe, yes, it but can. I've, You've seen it happen. I've seen it happen, and, I, and I've seen it happen much more with women than with men. Mm -hmm. I will just say that. But I do not believe that sexual orientation claim uh, changes are a gospel imperative. Right, and it, right that doesn't have I'm, to change I'm if you're a believer. I'm on record for saying reparative, her uh, reparative therapy is a heresy. Uh, it's the heresy of the prosperity gospel. You know, one of the things that's hard for American Christians especially is that on this earth, God will give some people ten crosses to bear and another person one. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the prosperity gospel, the, it, you know, is to say, no, commit your life to Jesus and all will be well. But that's not what the gospel says. Not at all. What the gospel promises is that if God gives you a heavy cross to bear, the Lord himself will uphold the heavier parts. But God forbid Christians weigh on that cross. And I think that when we, um, when we uh, look at orientation change as proof of gospel fruit, we're actually weighing on that cross. Let the Lord work in the life of that person. That person is a precious son or daughter to the Lord himself. And uh, there is a vital role for single and celibate Christians in our families, in our churches, and in our world. You described your conversion as as bittersweet. Is is that something? First of all, I'm you so first sorry. of all you never hear conversion described that way. I'm it's so it, it's not the Christian way to do it. You I should do. know that. I do. Know. Oh yes. Uh, uh, yes. Um, but you know, it, I thought that was really interesting. It, I think anybody who has been on this earth and comes to Christ as an adult needs to be prepared for that. It, it seems like I they're have, not, right? I have to tell you. Uh, yes, I think that's right. And I'm just trying to be honest. <laughs> and you can pray for me, okay? I mean, you know, look, I was all out there. You can pray for me. But uh, the gay and lesbian community is a real community. And, uh, and you know what? The Christian church has a lot to learn. Not about theology, not about salvation, not about the Lord, but about standing with the disempowered, accompanying suffering, and being good company for the suffering. Now, I, I came of age in the gay community when AIDS had just unleashed itself and we didn't know what it was. And um, that is hard. That is a very hard thing. But one of the things that is true, and it is just universally true, standing with the disempowered is a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. I often speak to parents who have who feel like they have lost uh, covenantal children to the gay community. And what I will say to them is, you will have to work very hard to love your son and daughter better than the gay community is. I'm sorry to say that. I know that's shocking. I know that's scandalous. But it's just how it is. You but know it, the truth. I am telling you that you will have to work very hard to, uh, because we have, uh, and I think it's in part because of our real lack of, um, a, and a, a real understanding of what church membership means. Uh, and, and, and a lack of understanding that the church is not a man-made institution, it's, it's a God-made institution. We, we are so shaky on these things uh, that we have made it, uh, you know, the, the, the resonating effect of that is that we tend to have very fractured communities instead of an integrated, loving one that can embrace people who are, um, who are lost and who are scared. And you know, well, the thing that, that I want Christians to know too is the worst part about same-sex attraction, I think if you, pretty much if you ask anybody, it's actually not the sex. I mean, or lack of it. Right. You know? It's the loneliness and it's the fear of growing old alone. 
And if you look at our churches and you say, wow, the only people who are not alone on Christmas and Mother's Day and da 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 are people who are in marriages. That gives a terrible example of what the church is supposed to be. If the church is available and alive and present and a community by invitation only, see, that's not a community. That's not a community. So we've got. So I, I, I suppose what I want to say is um, probably a lot of that is my sin. If I'm still bittersweet about this, but I long for a real Christian community. Oh, so, okay. So so with gay marriage becoming the norm rapidly yes. in this country, right. is does is it more of a moment of great opportunity for the church, or is it more of a moment of great peril? Uh, well, it had better be a moment of great opportunity because today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. You know, the Lord is determining your circumstances and your circumstances do not determine whether you're going to get up and do something. But we need to share the gospel and we need to stop adding to the gospel. And what I mean by that is we need to share the gospel of hope in Jesus, not rants about anal sex, for example. You know, I, I mean, you know, I'll tell you for the, you know, most folks in the lesbian community have some opinions about it too. So <laughs> it's not just that good Bible believing Christians have some issues, but, but it, that can be very distracting. That can be very distracting. We have sadly decided to take, you know, you know, pull, pull punches, take attacks from the, you know, from behind the walls instead of really coming up beside our friends and our neighbors. And I'm a Reformed Christian. I, I believe that God's elect people are everywhere, including the gay and lesbian community. Uh, I, so, of course, of course this is the opportunity God gave us. I was, I was even uh, praying with someone recently who thanked God for these times. I was quite rebuked by his prayer because I have not been doing that. Just to, you know, um, but I think that's the right prayer. I think this is the moment that the Lord has made. Let me end it right here. You, you describe your past as an R-rated past. Uh, you're certainly not the only parent out there who has an R-rated past. And it doesn't have to be homosexuality. Right. There, are, there are plenty of us who have had Absolutely. affairs or were promiscuous when we right. were younger. Let me ask you, how do... First of all, do you have to talk about that R-rated past at some point with your kids? And if so... How? Is, is that an important enough part of your story that you must right, share with right, them? Right, right, right. You know, I think that uh, marriages are, are very precious things. And so uh, in your marriage, you need to discuss how you will talk to your children. In our household, it has always been open. We read through the Bible as a family, and as we come up to certain passages, why, there I am. You know, I am Rahab the harlot. There, there was never a day when we sat down with our children and they said, okay, we have something very serious yeah. to tell you, you know, your mother was an atheist and a lesbian and you were adopted. Okay, great, <laughs> never talk to me again about it. It's all over. I mean, right? right. You know, right. We, we're all messy people. We're very messy people. So, um, so my, my children, they were raised cutting their teeth on this conversation. <laughs> um, it seems to me that it is important to talk to children in a way that is that is appropriate to their, uh, you know, to their situation. But if you don't talk to them, someone else will. You see, Christians are called to be good stewards of ideas. And if you just say, well, I'm just going to wait this out, you are neglecting um, a, a responsibility of, of, of the covenants. Because if you don't steward those ideas, why, someone else will. And then it becomes hard for your children. You know, why are my lesbian neighbors the nicest people on the block? Well, you know, God's common grace is something that you need to yeah. teach them about. Sure, sure. And if all you do is, is, is um, you know, all sort you do stuff is it under. Yeah. either stuff it under or simply rehash the old ghost stories, at some point your kid's going to say, well, but they're nice to me. You know, they're genuinely kind. When the dog got loose, they returned the dog. They made me brownies on my birthday. You know, God's common grace is not something to um, to fear. But that's not, that's not the full story because there are only two things that are eternal, the word of God and the souls of people. 
Mm. And we need to get to the business of majoring on those majors. A wonderful note on which to end this interview. Rosaria Butterfield, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark.